Good afternoon, everyone. The University of Maine recognizes that it is located on Marsh Island in the homeland of the Penobscot Nation, where issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing. Penobscot homeland is connected to the other Wabanaki tribal nations, the Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq, through kinship, alliances, and diplomacy. The university also recognizes that the Penobscot Nation and the other Wabanaki tribal nations are distinct sovereign legal and political entities with their own powers of self-governance and self-determination. Here, here. <laughs> My name is Emily Haddad. I'm Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, which hosts the mostly annual Maine Heritage Lecture. <laughs> this lecture is the 13th in the series. The Maine Heritage Lecture is chosen by a faculty committee from among nominations received. The 2022 lecturer, Margot Lukens, is a professor of English, and her colleague, Darren Ranko, professor of anthropology and chair of Native American programs, will introduce her shortly. It is my pleasure now to welcome John Vollen, Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost, who will make some welcoming remarks. So I think uh, my instructions were, you have 30 seconds. Uh, so. <laughs> uh, but no, welcome. I, this is very exciting. Uh, when, I, when I saw this year's uh, Maine Heritage Lecture, uh, this is, this is going to be wonderful. Uh, and so um, I do um, have just a few words. Uh, and uh, I don't know if it's 30 seconds, but it'll be close. Uh, so good afternoon. I, I am humbled. Um, to join each of you in this year's uh, Maine Heritage Lecture. Um, this year's lecture is based on the outstanding bilingual tale titled Still They Remember Me, which is co-authored by um, Carol Dana, Connor Quinn, and Professor Margo Lukens. There's, there's Margo, yes, great. Uh, so when I did a bit of research on this, you know, I came across some advice uh, that uh, Dr. Lukens shared when she won the UMaine Alumni Association Faculty Excellence Award in 2019. She said, do what you're really interested in and love to do, and don't be afraid to branch out. Look for space to grow your new ideas. I just love that, and I think um, that's what she's done. Uh, you know, uh, Margo has explored Native American literature during her time as a graduate student, uh, and this interest has only grown and become the basis of her career, her research, her teaching, her scholarship. So today, uh, her work alongside with her co-authors allows us to learn from the Penobscot people with stories presented in both the Penobscot language and English side by side. Uh, Margo, we're honored to listen to your lecture today, and we hope that it actually serves as an inspiration to many who value the relationship between the University of Maine community and the Wabanaki people. So looking forward to it. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Sorry. I was trying to keep it quick. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, Sorry, no. <laughs> but I, I wanted to say a little bit about the lecture. Um, the Maine Heritage Lecture is the only annual uh, intellectual event, not an administrative event, not an award ceremony, but the only annual intellectual event that's organized and sponsored by the Dean's Office and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Its purpose is to invite a long, this is not a too long did not read kind of event, but a long, deliberate, careful look at the past. Every one of the lectures that I have attended, and this is the eighth, also narrates the past as a way to question or to reaffirm, or both, the values that guide us now and into the future. Our current time seems characterized by rancor, anxiety, and an impatience with complexity that does not serve our society well. In this moment, Opportunities such as this to pause and think deeply have a special value. Like most traditions, the Maine Heritage Lecture has some ritual elements. One of these is to acknowledge by name any previous lecturers in attendance. All of their names are in your program. Since the last lecture was given, sadly, two lecturers have passed away. The inaugural, inaugural Maine Heritage Lecturer, Professor of Anthropology James Atchison, died in June of this year. And Howard Siegel, professor of history, died in November 2020, just after the last lecture was given. 
I will read the remaining names and invite any former lecturers who are present to stand, stay standing, and we'll recognize them all at the end. Liam Reardon, Darren Ranko, Catherine Olmsted, Stephen Hornsby, Paulina McDougall, Carol Toner, Kristen Langelier, Richard Judd, Sanford Fippen, and Kenneth Palmer. Welcome, Margot, to this illustrious company. I would also like to thank selection committee members, also named in your program, and the other members of the college who helped organize this event, especially Alan Adams um, did the heavy lifting on the program. Kelly Jilks did like pretty much everything to make sure that there was actually a physical place to go and uh, <laughs> other things. Um, and Greg Zaro, who led the selection committee. Uh, Carol Dana, who is listed in your program as a co-presenter, is not able to participate in person, so you will meet her shortly on the screen. Um, after the presentation, there will be an opportunity for audience members to ask questions, so store those up. Um, and there will also be a reception, um, we believe downstairs, possibly in one of the, the hallways, but um, we hope downstairs in the Hudson Museum that is sponsored by the McGillicuddy Humanity Center. Special thanks to um, McGillicuddy Humanity Center board member Philip Hamilton and his wife Susan for um, providing the funding for that. We really appreciate it. Um, the Hudson Museum is open, so uh, also feel free after the, the talk to, to go down and visit, regardless of where the reception ends up being. And now Darren um, has an opportunity <laughs> to introduce uh, the speaker. Great. Well, I really want, was excited about getting to this today. Um, uh, and I'm, it's such an opportunity. I'm, uh, I am excited about sharing this, and I want to introduce um, not only Margot, but of course, uh, a couple other people. Um, Newell Lyon, whose stories um, uh, form the, the, the core of our content that we'll be discussing today, uh, needs an introduction as well. Um, he, without him, we would not be here. Uh, he learned the oral tradition from his elders in, in uh, my tribe, the Penobscot Nation, and was widely considered to be a rencontre among the Indians. I, I think this reflects that he was uh, both considered too malice or either too Italian or something <laughs> to be considered uh, an authentic uh, Penobscot person, but he was recognized as, as, as a leader in, in both story and word uh, in the community. In response to Fanny Hardy Ekstrom, who wrote her opus, Old John Neptune and Other Maine Indian Shamans, uh, where she describes Newell Island as an unreliable source, the anthropologist Frank Specht called her out for this and saying that in fact, Newell Lyon was far above suspicion for his integrity as a person and as an informant, which, as an anthropologist, that's the highest regard you could possibly <laughs> give someone. Um, I think more importantly, as Carol Dana writes in, in, in Newell Lyon's work with anthropologist Frank Speck over 100 years ago, Newell Lyon consulted Penobscot elders to verify and enrich details to her, and she'll share this. This shows how we never operate alone even the elders from long ago. And I think that connection is really important in this work. Um, I also want to introduce Carol. I haven't been asked to do that, but I, I feel like I should. Um, and I've done this before. I believe Carol Dana is a national treasure, um, both, and I mean that for the Penobscot Nation, but more broadly as an American treasure. She was f first exposed to our language at a young age. She heard Passamaquoddy spoken at her maternal grandmother's home and her desire to learn the language was born from those first moments. As a teenager, Carol made the conscious effort to visit speaking elders to learn the language. In 1982, she began working as a research assistant to Dr. Frank Siebert. Their work together led to the creation of the Penobscot Dictionary, as did the stories shared by Newell Lyon um, in, in, uh, in the core of this work today. She achieved her master's in education, studied language immersion at St. Thomas College in New Brunswick, completed workshops at the Indigenous Language Institute, and received a cert certificate in secondary language learning from here at the University of Maine. She's been honored at the Algonquin Language Conference with the W.E.B. Du Bois Award for Lifetime Achievement for her work with language revitalization. She has published two books of poetry, When No One Is Looking, and Return to Spirit. 
Uh, even in retirement, she continues to teach our language widely in our community, sharing um, the, the words with people mostly online these days, but um, it's always great to see and hear her uh, teaching the language. She has uh, six children and 14 grandchildren. I want to make sure uh, I know many of them. Uh, some amazing people there. Actually, they're probably all amazing. I think 14 is the right number. Yes. It's been a year or so since I've looked at my notes. Um, not, no great grandchildren as far as I know. Um, and that's Carol Dana, and she's just such a valuable and unique person in this world. I just, I'm so grateful that even virtually she's joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Just all the work she's done is just hard not to get emotional around it. Uh, introducing Margot. Margot Lukens is a professor in the Humane Department of English where she teaches colonial to 19th century Anglo-American and a variety of Native American literatures. Her research interests include Wabanaki literary and storytelling history, Native American First Nations drama, innovation, and decolonization. Um, she was born and raised in the Philadelphia area where her family arrived nearly 350 years ago as religious refugees. I just really wanted to mention that because you've mentioned that before and I, that and then being educated at Harvard and doing graduate work at the University of Colorado, she taught first at Swarthmore before coming to the University of Maine in 1992. Um, she's done a lot of startup projects and one thing I really want to share about Margot personally is just like there are very few people who have the curiosity of mind and the diligent hard work to start things as broad as uh, the Orono Community Theater, Penobscot Players, the Innovative Engineering Minor and Certificates, Stillwater Community Arts Organization, True North Theater. All of these things are a collection of work in innovation and commitment to performance and literary um, traditions that are really amazing. She also has edited the uh, volume of work on the plays of William S. Yellowrobe Jr. Um, and collaborated with the late Yellowrobe on a number of publications and other theatrical productions. Um, she was the director of the, McGill the McGillicuddy Humanities Center at UMaine for two years um, and is involved in a number of projects currently including the publication of traditional Penobscot texts for the purpose of language revitalization. She'll talk about that today, but also in the development of a Wabanaki resources portal to increase access to digitized materials on Wabanaki culture and history in support of LD 291, the state of Maine law requiring the teaching of Maine Indian history and culture to all of Maine students. Please join me in welcoming Margot Lukens. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. I'm going to plug Carol in and bring her into the room. There we are. Carol, we can hear you now, I think. All right. Yeah. Yes. So um, I I'm just really grateful for. Darren's introductions, and it's totally appropriate that Newell Lyon got the introduction first. He's, he's the source that Carol and I have to go to for these stories, and, and uh, that Carol got a great introduction too. It's really important that uh, you all be aware of how, uh, what an amazing uh, thinker and uh, carrier of language that she is. And that, that's why I wanted to have her present in uh, this event, because none of this work would have happened with me unless, unless it were for Carol. And I'll talk more about that later. So um, I want to uh, turn it over to Carol right now so she can begin with some remarks and, and she'll talk a little bit about how she began her work with the language. And um, let me know when, when you want me to step in then. Okay, thank you, Margo. I'd like to read my poem in uh, Still They Remember Me. I had written a poem about Guskov in 1976. 
It's uncurled in darkness without form, waiting, waiting for a special dawn, to be born to a people great and good, the people of the Northeastland wood. My name is Guscabe, as the stories tell, all over our great country I did dwell. I taught al Naba how to live in ages past, when they were so very young, their livelihood was made to last. I didn't leave a detail undone. Now I watch and wait and see how much people prolong their misery, how much we adopt foreign ways, and if you can truly forget together our days. I will return if you call my name, but slowly I hear your voices wane. Protect the people's ways, don't let them be crushed, reduce them lives to misery. My spirit dwells in every creature and tree. When you address the powers, think of me. I'm curled in darkness without form, waiting, waiting for a special dawn. This is for Gosesanawak, our descendants, and Nagunsozak, our ancestors. We at Penobscot Nation look to publish the Transformer Tales because it contains the Galusawakano of our ancestors. And my interest in uh, Transformer Tales goes back to when I worked for Frank Lester Bassett came by with the stories in a little booklet. And uh, they were Transformer Tales. As we know, I'm from Frank Speck and New Alliance. And I had lent one to my cousin who was uh, working in uh, Indian Island School at the time, Gary Dana. And uh, I think James had made copies of them at, with red covers at the Indian Island Museum. So they've been there and I've been aware of them. Uh, in 82, I worked for Frank and I took my knowledge of language that I heard and I applied it to the written system and I found it to be true and somehow I got to reading the language and uh, I'll talk a little bit about my uh, journey into that. I left uh, Frank and the tribe in 1985 because I wanted to go to college because I wanted to teach Penobscot and uh, we had work with Madeline Shea at the time too. Uh, and I was hired as a teacher aide for a number of years at the Indian Island School, even though I had a degree. And in 1996, I started teaching the language. Only a couple of days, 20 minutes, a half hour a week, and it really wasn't enough. But what I did at the time was plays in early childhood. Uh, I was amazed that the kids uh, did the plays, you know. they. We didn't do them in the language then, but we did them in English. And then we had Indian Day there. And uh, the eighth graders, I didn't teach them to read the language either, but I would make them cue cards and then I'd hold them up and then read it. You know, they, they want to remember what their lines were. So we had done that. And uh, in, when I was in college, I worked with uh, Chris Mears for a while because I always thought, we're in this predicament where our native language, our mother tongue is our second language. So maybe second language learning methods would help us. So uh, him and I talked, in fact, I finished a course uh, in second language acquisition, I believe, because I was interested in the methodology and he brought Stephen Crash into campus and Stephen Crash and said, if you can read in the language, you can speak it. And I pinned a lot of my hopes on that because I could read. Uh, I can read in the language, you know. When I can speak it, I can't uh, move right along in it. I haven't been tested, you know, that much, but uh, I have a good work and knowledge of it. And someone asked me one day, "How do you get to do that?" So I came home and I'm sitting in my easy chair thinking. Well, I've only been in it 52 years <laughs> since I got to do it. Uh, I want to mention my friend Sipsis. Her and I spoke a lot about the culture and the stories. And I tell her a story, and next thing you know, she'd be doing a puppet play in it, you know. And she was a great advocate of our ways and our stories. And I got permission from her to be able to 
retell the stories too. Uh, I also went to St. Thomas College sponsored immersion uh, teaching in uh, St. Mary's, what they call Sedansk, in, across the river from Fredericton. And she said, story is the basket in which our language is, is carried. And that just stayed with me, you know, because uh, one of my stories, one of my favorite ones is about the uh, Medallion at Pushaw, and they're testing each other's powers. Well, not testing each other, but uh, showing each other their powers. So when they're about to be defeated, they change to an animal. So they're jumping in the water, turning around and coming out, you know, Musquasso, uh, Tamakwe, Madewila, Musabasso, uh, different animals. And I use that story with the children. But what I like about it, it's cyclical. So you hear these words over and over, and uh, you know what they mean. You know, when Chris told me, tell a story in English first that puts down a layer of meaning, and then tell it in the uh, Penobscot, because they already know what's going on in the story. So uh, pictures help. I had some other ideas. Uh, we wanted to talk about how the transformer tales of these stories bring language to us. And my own process is, uh, and I think Sophia Warner, Ashton Warner, or Weaver talked about this, when you have an emotional attachment to a word, uh, you learn it more. Mm -hmm. Like on one, uh, Huska was always going off somewhere doing something, that a mission that Grandma uh, sent him on, and, uh, he tells her one day, Musa Sahigach, don't worry, you know. And I love that. That stayed with me. So Margo tells me that often. <laughs> <laughs> and I love hearing that. You know, someone saying, Musa Sahigach, you know, it's like, all right. <laughs> so when the, oh yeah, uh, talk about the plays at Knopfscott Theatre. Uh, all of these things happen rather serendipitously. We, I, well, how I first met Margo, these ladies invited me over, Neville, you know, to uh, watch some plays, and I think she was working with uh, these guys in Canada, too. Uh, but Bill Yellowrobe came around, and we talked about plays, and we talked about plays in the language, and at one point, we were meeting about Plays, and everyone had great ideas, but nothing of any substance. And National Park Service had money that they wanted ideas of what to do with. And Barry Newport was in Penobscot Theater, and she had talked to Margo, and I think Margo talked to Donna. Uh, somehow it came around to us, and uh, I was getting frustrated with that group because nothing was really coming for it. And I kept telling Margo, look at these plays, Margo. You know, all we have to do is script them up. There's a whole thing there, you know, an ongoing uh, chronicle series of stories. So that's what we did. And uh, so I remembered our talk about doing uh, plays in the language. And I said, well, they have to remember their lines in the play. Let's to Penobscot, so a lot of it we kept in the uh, Penobscot language. So that was the big debut for that. Also at the time, there was a lot of negative press about Penobscot and the river. And uh, usually when issues come up uh, about Native Americans, there's a lot of bad press. And uh, you know, it's part of an old thing that always happened. But at this point in time, it seemed that things were turning around. and. Uh, there's a lot of good press that happened, you know, from our plays. And I remember a quote, you know, I read a lot, and this one thing was, if you want to get to know a people, read their folklore. You know, when people don't know about us, I've talked to people about, well, maybe I'll teach, you know, about us. And I've been in the trenches since the 70s <laughs> doing this with uh, Wabanaki Maritimes and uh, Dean Bennett's uh, Dirigo and, uh, <laughs> you know, trying to educate people about us, because it seems there's a lot of misconceptions. Some people don't even realize we have our own government. 
you know, over here on the island. And, uh, I think more needs to be uh, known about us. But that's kind of my uh, pass. Oh, also, I just got to throw this out here because right after Knobscott Theater and the play and all the great press and the celebration we had doing that, there was a movie that came out that Jose, you and I watched called Kubo and the Two Strings. And I could tell it was based on a Japanese uh, folk tale. And I said, wouldn't that be great if we had a film like that in anime, you know, with our Transformer tales in Penobscot? So we're still dreaming. And Margo and I talk. The work isn't done. You know, it's just the beginning. And uh, we talked about doing the play, taking it on the road, and uh, having a computer site with a language, uh, you know, like myself, uh, reading a game in the language that goes along with the book, uh, puppet shows, and I try to bring back storytelling. I do storytelling now at the Bangor Public Library on Zoom in the winter. You know, that whole cyclical thing about that's a sacred time, the stories are told. And it's part of our cosmogony, like what fuels our universe. It what It's what keeps us going. And I've read about uh, putting tobacco out, which I try to do, you know, I try to remember that before I tell stories and uh, you put tobacco out for the people in the stories, you know, and uh, it just makes me feel good that, you know, we're still, we're still here, we're still thriving, we're still going, you know, and uh, I think language is so important to us and our well-being, our health, our mental health as people, you know, there's no uh, swearing and uh, violence. In fact, I want to make this point because uh, in that story and in other ones, it talks about Awudin and the linguist said that it means war. And my elder, Edwina, who's Malice, said that means a contest. And that's how we used to uh, decide things. Say there was a disagreement, there'd be a contest or a game. Maybe they played lacrosse, and whoever won, you know, their way uh, was implemented. And I think that's how we settled disputes. And uh, that was a great point that she made with us, you know, and. Uh, in one part of the story, too, it said, uh, was it Chekamen or Uskab had done something? And I asked past Macquarie's what that word meant. And they said, oh, like if you hit a home run, you know, you hit it a little uh, harder than usual. But uh, <laughs> Corner says, no, it means you hit him to the children. Well, we don't know that, you know, maybe these guys, because these are the people speaking. I still have to keep in touch with my people and talk to them, you know, because uh, they're in a better position than we are with language. And uh, I like how my language brought me to that. You know, I don't have elders right here that I can speak to, but I used to be able to talk to Wayne and, you know, my cousin Madonna. And, others you know that have the language and ask them different things so <clears throat> this kept me uh right grounded you know and i'm so grateful so that's all i want to say i'll turn it over to margo and we can talk about the films and stuff but it's been uh, quite a learning journey and i'm grateful for that thank you carol So as I said I would do, I'm going to shrink Zoom and bring up this slideshow, which you've set us up for so well. Um, and I'm going to um, uh, touch on a lot of the things that Carol has mentioned and um, follow them up. So, oops, how do I get it? The word, not war. 
I don't, contest. Uh, contest, yes. And what is the, uh, the she was talking about how the um, uh, shamans uh, did a contest to see whose powers were stronger. Oh, the and, and the shamans changing themselves into a loon or a muskrat. Or, so that's, what, that's where she was going. What is the, uh, the other one was a contest in another story, how they settled matters was through a contest, not a war. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And what was the word? Awadin. What? Awadin. A-W-O-T-I-N. Awadin. A-W-O-T-I-N. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. All right. So um, we both mentioned Zipsis. Or, uh, Zipsis uh, was a wonderful person. I met her through her son, who was in my first American literature class ever at the University of Maine. He came up to me and uh, talked to me after class about two-thirds of the way through the semester, saying, you know, I really like the way you bring in um, Native American writings to your American Lit class, but um, do you have other sources for Native American writing from here, this place? And I said, well, you know, I actually don't know very much. I just got here. Um, but I have heard of one writer whose name is Zipsis. And he said, oh, that's my mom. <laughs> so, but, but he, I, I said, please, you know, <laughs> introduce me to her. Um, we had a, a long friendship. And um, sadly, she passed away in 2015. But um, we just wanted to um, bring her into the conversation here because, indeed, she was a descendant, a direct descendant of Newell Lyon. And Carol mentioned having asked uh, Carol asked uh, Zipsis for the permission to tell uh, the stories that are in the Newell Lyon cycle called Transformer Tales. And uh, so that's how, how Carol began working with the stories. And in 2015, when we got this invitation from uh, Penobscot Theater via Acadia National Park, or other way around. Um, that's why Carol really brought those stories um, to us. Again, here's a photo of Newell Lyon. And he, uh, uh, as, as Darren mentioned, he learned from his elders, elders in the tribe. So he's born in 1846. Consider that the people he was learning the stories from were probably born before 1800, you know, in the 1780s, 90s. And the people they learned the stories from born in the 17 teens and before them back into the 1600s. And so pretty quickly, the, the tradition of storytelling takes you before colonial times. And that's why it's so important to have someone like New Align and like Carol telling the stories carrying the language in that, in that basket of the story. Um, he was uh, visited by Frank Speck. There are two Franks in this story. This is the earlier Frank, Frank Speck, uh, who came from Philadelphia and between uh, 1910 and around 1918 when the, the stories were first published. Um, he worked with a number of people, but mainly um, with Newell Lyon. And uh, a very short time after these stories came out, they came out in the volume one of the American um, uh, International Journal of American Linguistics, um, Young Field. And, uh, but he died in a hunting accident in the winter of 1919. So um, he really um, left, left the earth with this, um, this legacy. So. Must have been around in that time too, huh, Margo? Siebert? Yeah. Siebert, I, I don't think he arrived until like the 20s or 30s. He and okay. Speck knew each other in Philadelphia. Okay. Right? And it was, it was a little later. I, I don't think he ever would have met Newell Lyon. Oh, okay. No, I mean Speck and Siebert. To, r r okay, yeah, right. But they definitely knew each other. Um, yeah. But I think it was later than, than uh, when New Align was alive. Okay. And uh, w w sidebar, um, 
early in our process, I did some research at the American Philosophical Society because I knew that the Frank Speck papers were there and the Frank Siebert papers were there. Siebert is the second Frank, and uh, he's the one that Carol mentioned working with to help um, refine the uh, orthography, the current official Penobscot writing system. Um, and uh, you could see in, in the Speck papers, um, or in the, in the Siebert papers, there would be copies of things that were in the Speck papers, but with Siebert's handwriting on them, doing yeah. corrections, <laughs> trying to figure things out. So um, Carol uh, already mentioned the, the play that we got up to, and this um, was on the occasion of the Acadia National Park Centennial in 2016. Um, they had come to Penobscot Theater and said, is there anything on your schedule that would be appropriate to the centennial? And um, the theater's uh, artistic director said, let me ask some people. And she was very interested in finding out why is Penobscot Theater named that and what does it mean? She was not from here. She was um, curious and uh, began thinking about that. She contacted Donna Loring. Donna Loring said, talk to Margot. She's done community theater with a lot of people. So, um, and, and Eventually, uh, we ended up at my house around the dinner table, about eight people from Penobscot Nation and me, and, and Carol, as she said, uh, you know, bringing out the old 1918 photocopies of, of the Transformer Tales when we got, you know, uh, a lot of pie in the sky ideas. And eventually, so we ended up with the first 13 of the stories in the old. Uh, I-J-A-L article by Frank Speck describe the life of Glascabi from when he's a little boy with his grandmother, Minim Kwasu, the woodchuck. And it goes all the way until he has, has changed the landscape. He's, he's interacted with uh, animals and forces of nature and made this part of the world sustainable for life by his descendants. And he's always, you know, you're always thinking about descendants and ancestors. And so here's, a, this was the premiere performance at the Indian Island School. And this young lady is playing Minim Kwasu, the grandmother, grandmother Woodchuck, and this young man is Gluskabe. And Gluskabe's all excited because he's come home uh, having gone out hunting with this magical game bag that his grandmother has knitted for him out of her own belly hair. <laughs> And he's figured out that all he had to do was tell the animals that the world was going to end, but they didn't have to see that if they got in his bag. Come on in, come in. And they're like, ooh. And um, so he, he comes home all happy, thinking that what he's done is make life easier for himself and his grandmother. And her reaction, Atama golalugu guenas. You did not do a good thing at all, my grandchild. And so this young lady said those words, said the Penobscot words, and then the English words. And this, we, we created the script so that an Anglophone audience could hear Penobscot and understand why they were hearing it. And, um, uh, but the point was, don't take all the animals now. What will our descendants have to eat? Don't build that huge fish weir and keep all the fish for us. What will our descendants have to eat? He has to learn the lesson more than once. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's a, a lovely uh, relationship. And she's, she's the source of the wisdom that he learns. Um, here's a, another uh, picture of this is at the Penobscot Theater. This is where we get all the bells and whistles of Penobscot Theater productions. And uh, there, there's the giant frog, Aglubemu. There are two people inside that frog costume. And uh, this is Gluskabe. We, we had many Gluskabes in, in this production. And, the, the frog is holding back all the water, and the people are dying of thirst. So Gluskabi tries to reason with the frog, tries to wrestle with the frog, tries to break the frog's back, but finally has to fell a tree onto the frog, and um, out of the frog comes the Penobscot River. And all of the, the branches of the river, uh, the whole you know, Penobscot watershed, and these thirsty people all dive in and just slake their thirst and swim. And some of them get out and continue being people. 
and some of them turn into fish or turtles or other water creatures, salamanders and dragonflies even. And um, out of that story comes the knowledge that the clan names of Penobscot people are from that moment. Clan names are uh, the names of animals from the river. And that the Penobscot people have a time immemorial relationship to the, not only the river, but to the creatures in it. And it's a family relationship. These are mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, children. So after we did a few of these performances of the play, um, Donna Loring invited us to WERU to her radio show and interviewed, um, there's Carol on the right, that's Amy Rader, who was at the time director of education at Penobscot Theater. And this is Carmela Baer, um, daughter of the Penobscot Nation ambassador, Molly and Dana. And uh, she played, uh, I think she played Guscabi in a few scenes, and she also played an amazing character named Bookchin Squasu. She did an amazing job with that. But so we did this interview, and you can listen to it, it's archived uh, uh, at WRU. And we all felt really good about it, it came out into the parking lot, and Carol turned to me, you know, before we even got in our cars. She said, Margot, we have to republish these stories. And so what she was talking about is going from this kind of dense uh, academic quality article kind of publication with a very um, Victorian style English translation that's you know it's kind of stilted and and it you know won't say anything scatological even though some of the stories have some you know scatological things in them. Um, and here, the, uh, the presentation of a language, um, I'll read you just a little bit. So this, this is from the first story where Gliscabe, as a little boy, is learning how to hunt, how to shoot a bow and arrows, and he's gone out and gotten a few things, and he comes home this time. Gudilon, buenas, kichiawas, nechlad, awesus, nagasivi, nigwap, and what she's saying is, grandson, a great beast you have killed, a bear. And indeed, now we shall live well. There is abundant fat. That's Frank Speck's choice. And you did well, we shall live richly. So, you know, um, not designed particularly with a language learning audience in mind, much more designed with a, a, an ethnolinguist audience. Okay, so <laughs> Carol and I, when, when she said this to me over the, you know, the top of my car, um, I said, this is very good timing. I have a sabbatical now. I've told them I'm going to do something else, but, <laughs> but this is more important. So we got to work, and uh, you've seen this picture on the, on the postcards of, of this lecture, but we did a lot of our initial meetings at um, Tim Horton's. <laughs> which is no longer open, but we loved, we loved going there. Um, and I did a lot of work um, uh, exploring and finding original documents at the American Philosophical Society I mentioned, and this piece of handwritten field notes is at Cornell in their rare manuscripts library. And uh, right here in the middle is that moment where Minim Kwasu, the grandmother, is scolding Guskabi for taking all the game animals. Atama, Kulalagu, Kuenas. And so it was very exciting to see, you know, this is the first time it was written down. Um, and so we, uh, as we shaped this book, we managed to get uh, connected with um, University of Massachusetts Press. We got a contract, we got a deadline, and then it was COVID. And this was ironic, but even though, I mean, Carol is in Indian Island, I'm here, Connor Quinn, the linguist that we worked with, is in Portland. We were, we were separated, but we were together because we had Zoom, and suddenly um, Zoom became the tool by which we managed to do the, the, the copy editing work and the, the, you know, the final manuscript work. And um, what we got to, if you hadn't seen the book yet, um, 
this is not very well focused. But anyway, this is Penobscot on this side. Um, and each of these lines is, it, is it a, either a big phrase or a sentence. And across the page is the English. And we've updated the English translation so that the English words follow as closely as possible what the Penobscot words are doing. And below each uh, of these bigger sentence groups are individual words translated literally across the page. Mm -hmm. So um, this, th we did this because the central audience, and Carol articulated this very early in the process, was really Penobscot people who presently speak English or you know, d do not have a, a um, strong connection but want a stronger connection with traditional language. And so this construction of, of the book and the purpose of the book really is to um, invite that central audience back to their patrimony, their traditional language. And there are all kinds of audiences around that audience, but uh, that's the central purpose. Um, so here, here's an example of how this book might be used and might help bring people together. Um, so in the fifth story, and here's a scene from Penobscot Theater, that Gluskabi is in his canoe and he has pushed it out and seen that it it, uh, it's a very good canoe. He, all he has to do is push once with his foot and it goes three looks as far as you can see is one look. So three looks in one push. Um, but the story, the purpose of his you know, needing a good canoe is so he can go to the island where uh, Grasshopper lives because Grasshopper's been um, hoarding all the tobacco. And the grandmother, Minim Kwasu, has said to Gluskabe, we need tobacco. We, you know, we need it for ceremonial purposes here. And uh, so Gluskabe goes out after that. And um, being able to think about the language and think about what the words might mean as far as um, traditional morality and values of a community is really important. So here's, here's a he or she is stingy, or literally is difficult. And the, the, the quality of stinginess really creates an obstacle for other people, creates difficulty, and, and especially in the story. Then this other word, Isolaman, I make it possible for her or him by my heart or my mind. And Gustavi is always making things possible with his mind. Um, he, he makes what uh, Carol refers to as a shaman's wish sometimes, or sings, sings his purpose, and it happens. But uh, the idea of sharing, the opposite of, of being stingy, and, and the act that, that uh, Gustavi is going to do in this story, um, really makes things possible for other people, as opposed to obstructing. So uh, we were very fortunate, and you know, the window apparently was, was wide open um, for support of this project. And um, we uh, got, got a grant for this book that included enough money to purchase a copy of it for every Penobscot household. Now. Uh, Little did I know at the time of, of, of writing the grant that, okay, you can give one to every home on Indian Island, but there are plenty of Penobscot households you know, out in the big world, and there's not a list, <laughs> uh, or not a list that's accessible to an outsider. So um, little by little, uh, people are getting their copies, and that's, I still have a pile of money, and I'm waiting for Penobscot people to tell me how to, how to send it to them. Um, so I have to do some more work on that. But you know, these are the other kinds of audiences that Carol and I have talked to, Carol and Connor Quinn and I, all three. Um, other readers from other indigenous communities have been interested in this bilingual presentation and in the content of the stories. Early childhood educators, 
um, we're really hoping that there will be uptake in Maine K-12 schools. And um, I had a grad student uh, a year and a half ago who was already an English teacher, a ninth grade teacher. And he, for his final project, he did um, a, like a three-week lesson plan that used English language arts standards that are articulated for Maine schools and applied those standards to lessons about a couple of the stories in this book and some contemporary Wabanaki poetry. It was, it was a lovely thing. And um, uh, I, I took him with me to a, a conference for K-12 educators and had him talk about it there. Um, any Maine citizen uh, who wants to know more about Penobscot Nation and Penobscot um, philosophy, uh, values, persistence, faith communities, conservation communities. Um, we've, we've already had uh, other scholars of indigenous literatures use the book in, um, in college classes. And of course, um, linguist Connor Quinn uh, is an amazing linguist. And he's pretty much the only guy around who specializes in Penobscot. And uh, there's a big, juicy section of special linguistics notes in, in the back. We call it technical notes on the New Alliant text. And there's, a, there's about uh, 50 pages of that. Um, there are some cultural notes on each story, but we didn't want to burden the casual reader or the, the young reader with, with all that juicy um, linguistic stuff. But um, so uh, I think I'm coming to the end of my remarks. And Carol and I, I'm sure, have lots more to say. And, and I'll bring her back so we can uh, engage you in Q&A. But I always like to end by saying great thanks. And it's to the people of the Penobscot Nation and other Wabanaki communities who have generously and patiently taught me how to do the work. Pardon? Kichi uh, Waliwini. Kichi Waliwini. Great thanks. And I also like to leave my, <laughs> my audiences with a place to do a little research if, you're, if you care about what's going on today with Wabanaki communities and purposes and politics. Go to the WabanakiAlliance.com and there's, there are a lot of ways you can um, learn about current legislation and reasons for it and, and history as well. So um, with that, um, I'm going to uh, end the slideshow and bring Carol back for the Q&A. But thank you very much. There you are. All right, Carol, can you hear us? Sure. All right, here we are. So it's time for Q and A. Yes. Less of a question and more of a remark. Hi, Carol. This is Lila. Lila Aiken is here. Right, it's, it's a little bit of stealth. I mean, if you start reading the stories, it'll be, oh, oh okay, oh, okay, yeah, all right. Thank you. Thanks, Lila. Um, she, she said that um, the, the book is a teaching tool for people who want to learn and maybe also for people who don't want to learn. <laughs> Uh, certainly the plays were, were that kind of a teaching tool. Carol mentioned that. Um, the script that we wrote uh, in 2015 and 2016 for, for the production of Transformer Tales at, at um, Penobscot Theater and other places belongs to the Penobscot Nation. And that's what Carol is talking about. You know, wouldn't it be great to create a, um, um, an on-the-road version of that? And we've sometimes talked about um, creating teaching tools so that we could send lessons to schools in advance and take the, you know, have, have teachers have the kids do pre-work, whether it's, you know, creating costumes or um, scenery or, you know, learning a few Penobscot words and phrases so they could be, you know, extras in the, in the river scene. 
Um, but that's one of our future projects. Carol also mentioned um, uh, Kubu and the Two Strings and the idea of, of animating or of putting, putting the stories into, into film. We are, we are talking about um, actually taking some of the longer stories. We have a volume two that's going to be very much like volume one um, in, in the works. But we're thinking volume three might be um, graphic novel format. But we don't know anything about making a graphic novel. So there, there's, you know, there's a lot of work ahead. Liam. I wonder if you could talk a bit about how you selected the stories for volume one and how you're going about with volume two. Did you hear that, Carl? Yes. You can talk to that one. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> well, so really the, the volume one uh, is the first 13 stories in that old original Frank Speck 1918 article because they're all about Muscovy going from youth to uh, mature adulthood. And at, at the end of the 13th story, he and his grandmother are preparing to go off somewhere until people need him again, right? And um, uh, the, last, the last line of the book is this title, um, Still They Remember Me. And it's, it's about how you know, the Scabe. Hey, right? Yes, we, yeah, we wanted, yeah, we wanted this uh, book to be able to be used in families and, and in, you know, with grandmas and in, you know, daycare and uh, little, little kids. Um, so we wanted to keep it completely G-rated. But at the end, he's, he's uh, uh, the lines are, now today, whenever he is told about in sacred stories, Gluskabi stops working for a moment. Then he raises his head and laughs. And then he says, yes, our descendants still remember me. And that's Esquide, Namiriwida Hamguk Gusas Nawak. That's, you know, still they remember me. Um, so, and the second book, as Carol pointed out, this is the G rated one. The second book starts out with some more Gluskabi stories. It's Gluskabi and, and Uncle Turtle, who is, he's the kind of the trickster figure of, you know, the appetite. Uncle Turtle always wants to get laid. Uncle Turtle wants to marry the totally inappropriate other person, and, and it tries to enlist Guscabi to help him. And well, what usually ends? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, but usually, usually the turtle ends up, you know, getting burned or you know, dropped or you know, something bad happens, in, as in a you know, t usual trickster scenario. And there's another one where Guscabi. Um, is, is boasting that he can, you know, show, you know, be better than anything or stronger than anything. And a young mother says, would you go in there with my baby right now? <laughs> and so he goes into the, the wigwam to the house and the baby, you know, is screaming and screaming and screaming. And Gustave you know, is trying to cajole the baby and, you know, doing all the, um, uh, you know, things you do when you're trying to make a baby pay attention and stop crying. And it just doesn't work at all. And, and finally, um, you know, he's, he's almost out of tricks. And the baby poops and then turns around and eats some of it. And Gustavi's like, no, oh, baby's winning. <laughs> so, so those kind of stories, we, we want those stories out there. And that's, those are volume two stories plus others. Um, but we wanted to make sure that volume one could go anywhere and that nobody would have any reason to suppress it. <laughs> PG-13, right. Right, and then the, uh, you know, the graphic novels are going to have, you know, like chopping off of heads and, you know, it's going to be all gory. And, and it's all, you know, the stories are very um, superhero-y in some ways. So I think graphic novel would, would work well if we can make that happen. What else? Yeah, Kathleen. Yeah. Um, was there originally a different alphabet for Penobscot, or was it only a spoken language earlier? I mean, you sort of transliterated it into our alphabet. Uh, I didn't do that. Right. No, but I mean, uh, the current, present day. I just wondered if there was some other alphabet way back. So 
She's asking whether Penobscot had an alphabetic writing system before, say, Frank Speck. And the answer is no, right? No, no. Yeah, no, yeah, it was an oral culture. And Frank Speck sort of did a seat of the pants, phonetic y kind of thing. But then when the other Frank came to Indian Island, Frank Siebert, um, he, you know, figured out a, um, a better, um, he had better grasp on the grammar by the time he finished. He spent longer with with Penobscot language than, than Speck ever did. I found a word, though, somebody linked me in Penobscot about Abba. We all used to say Abba, you know, if somebody did something. And Gabe said, we don't have a B in Penobscot. <laughs> and we're like, that's right, too. And my neighbor, she's about 10 years older than me. They all said a bar, too. So they didn't get everything, I guess. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, that's why you, you know, you can get things almost perfect, just get it out the door, publish it, you know, make it happen, and then somebody else can fix it, right? Yeah, good. Doug, you have a hand up. Yeah, that's a good question. Carol, did you hear Doug? No. Okay, so he's asking, and he noticed, he looked at the slide about stinginess and um, uh, sharing, and the question is about how an English word like stingy, it's just an adjective, but the Penobscot um, equivalent has action and relationship. And I would say, yeah, that's, that is characteristic. Um, Penobscot language is not like English, um, there are ca categories of nouns, and um, the categories, though, are animate and inanimate, which may also not be really evocative terms for actually what the what the rationale is in the language. I don't think li linguists have actually figured that one out. Um, but uh, and and nouns and verbs are inflected to let you know about relationship, either in physically in space, it could be relationship in time or present or not actually present. I mean, if you talk about someone who has passed away, the, the, the verb is inflected differently than if you're talking about someone who's here. Yeah. yeah. Right? Some things are directly translatable either. You know, Gabe Tanaska, he wrote some things that he said that aren't translatable, like a bar. You know, if you did something wrong, you'd say, oh, ah, I'm gonna tell. Like, we all knew what it meant, but you can't really translate it into certain words, mm. you know. But we know what it is, like Kadali, or Kadali, you know, right. or Eosis, or something like that, you know. Right, right, right. There, there are also, I mean, there's also really interesting things in Wabanaki languages um, of course, languages that coexist for a while tend to have loan words, and there are uh, loan words in English from Wabanaki languages. Moose is one, wigwam is another. Toboggan. Hmm? Toboggan, Toboggan right? Mm hmm. Um, and there are English and French loan words sometimes in Wabanaki languages. So that. Yep. Adieu, adieu. My grandmother said we used to say adieu. Mm -hmm. Well, they did. She's had some party. Uh, he's going with God. Uh, this is how they said goodbye, but we never say goodbye. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There's a philosophy that starts to come out from this. Right. So, so if the story is the basket in which language is carried, certainly, you know, the culture and, and the language are intimately connected and you, you find out so much about what motivates people what what it means to be a um a good human being and how to live in this place from uh listening to the language and paying attention to the stories how are we doing on time somebody who's paying attention to that oh, a ceremonial feature 
Okay, one or two more questions um, from people who haven't had a chance. <laughs> I'm going to go to Sarah and then to Naomi. Everyone always asks about the audio. Carol and I, you know, daily talk about that. And um, yes, we're going to figure out a way to um, at least get Carol and or Gabe Paul, who's uh, also working on language at Indian Island, to record the, these 13 stories and put them somewhere that people can find them on the web. Um, that's, as, that's as close as we're going to get to an audio book at this point, but thank you for asking, and that's something we really do need to deal with. Yeah. And Naomi, uh, last word. I'm really intrigued by the design of your book. It's such an elegant look on the page, and, and could you talk a little more about the rationale for setting up the pages of the translation in that way? Um, yeah, and, and actually, um, our linguist, Connor Quinn, I think needs to be credited with coming up with exactly what we have. We were very sure that we wanted some kind of a um, correspondence between the Penobscot and a free translation into English, a, a translation that would give you English sense, even while trying to preserve something about Penobscot uh, syntax and, and grammar. But, and we were also very sure that we wanted uh, each of the word segments in the Penobscot to have a literal translation across the page. So you could figure out which is the word that means bear, which is the word that means uh, fishing weir. Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, Carol. Um, just to, the question was about how did we come up, how did we come up with the, the layout? And, and as I said before, it's really about inviting learners of the language at whatever stage they are, right? Um, I mean, I... Yes. I want to mention that because even though we set it up that way, the language isn't always a direct translation into English. Like the Wasus, yeah, Wasus is what we call a bear, but we're saying the one who roams. You know, our language is like little picture poems, like a Jasante where it's a dragonfly, but you're actually saying one who's painted many colors. So right. It's very poetic and, you know, gives a picture. It's very descriptive. Right, like Ajita Weptawos. Yeah. That, that's the word for, um, what's, the, what's the English word? Nuthatch, yeah. And it means, yeah, he walks upside down. So that's, that's, the, that's the end of the Q&A, and I want to thank Carol again for being with us. Ceremony yeah, part. this is the last ceremony part. So um, it is a convention to provide the lecturer with a, um, a framed copy of the postcard. There's also one for Carol in our office that um, we'd love to get to you somehow, Carol. Um, okay. If you can uh, maybe share that information with Margo, best way to do it. Um, but we, we wanted you each to have one. And um, oh, thank, you. thank you so much, both of you. Yeah.